Hi everybody, welcome to the Victory Church channel. So glad to be able to share with you today, looking at James. We continue that journey, we've hit chapter 5, we're down the back straight to finish what we've started. And it is a challenging piece of scripture again from James. And I'm really trusting that as I share it with you that the Spirit of God would be meeting you as we journey through it. Let's unpack it and let's see what it has to say. James 5, 1-6 Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of your laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So, two things I want to comment on before we take a closer look at the scriptures. That word rich in this context is often used in the Old Testament where the prophets were denouncing the socio-economic oppression being exercised by the wealthy over the poor. So that's very important to note because where we could get hung up or face a challenge, if I have a lot, suddenly constantly live with a, a sense of guilt because I have so much and so it's never something that we explore in God's Word because we don't really know what to make of it. You know, we're doing really well, we, we love that. So how do we live with money when this is talking about, so we just leave it. So don't worry, we're going to go through this and if you have a lot or if you have a little, these scriptures are for you and I want to encourage you to stick around because it doesn't end with a stick. It should end, and it is God's word as we unpack it. I hope that it would leave you with a great sense of encouragement and relief if this is something that you've never really had the courage or perhaps it's been explained in a way that is actually understandable. So I'm hoping that you would receive the freedom that you need. And for those of us that don't have or very little, there is you and I in this space here to consider. So, what is at the heart of his message here? The idea that is also left in the research is it's not only to do with an old prophet way of speaking, rich interchangeable with the unsaved in this context, but it is to do with speaking to the unsaved. So that's actually what I meant by saying that the word in this context here can be interchanged when they would say rich it's actually talking about the unsaved that live in a way that's ungodly, unredeemed and I can't tell you exactly why they would interchange a word like that the commentaries that I've read never really elaborate on saying why they would use the word rich interchangeably with those that are unrighteous but that is the context here he's actually not talking about people that have a lot He's referring to the way that they conduct themselves. And the evidence of somebody saved is a transformed life. A life that is surrendered unto God. And a life that is surrendered to Satan, meaning not yet saved, has a lot of things in it where it's you're a law unto yourself, you're beholden to yourself, you answer to nobody. It's about you, yourself, and Whatever you decide is important. So when we unpack this scripture and these scriptures, we actually get to something of the heart of the matter. So I'd like to break this up into two components. I'm assuming that the audience that's listening to me is primarily saved individuals. And so a person that is saved finances, wealth, riches, property, there should be a great sense of appreciation from God that He's given us the privilege to steward this, but we should have in our hearts the, the resounding 
anthem of my life has been bought with a price, it's no longer my own. So whatever my agendas were, whatever my mission in life is, whatever I was using my finances before, I'm now on one knee as a servant and as a son going, Father, what is it that you have in store in my life? How is these that are running through my hands best to glorify you? What are we doing? So it's almost in the way of a person that has accrued an incredible amount of wealth that receives salvation. His eyes are open to the fact that he has a Lord and Savior and everything that he has, he's a custodian of. He's now a manager of God. So when he looks at these things, he's saying, okay, Lord, how, how do I walk this out in a way that brings glory and honor to you? And for the ones that are holding on to their treasures where Satan has hoodwinked them, because really that's what it is. Any person that does not have God but has wealth has a God. And that God is, is man. And he is one that demands much. And the Bible actually says in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despises the other. You cannot serve God and man. All of what I share in the translation I'm reading from is the ESV. This specific scripture I've chosen to use in the New King James Version because it actually uses the word mammon versus the others it says the love of money. And the reason why I highlight that is because it is the only context where God puts himself adjacent to another God to this magnitude. Not that there is any rivalry, but the rivalry in our hearts is of such a magnitude that it's worthwhile writing in that context. So notice, if you have been given a gift of being able to generate finances and wealth, it is something that in the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, etc., we can look at our hands and just be so enamored with what we can do, assuming that it's us. Now there is an element of truth to that because God created you, so yes, you do have that ability. But there is this scripture that drives us forward in saying, uh, let me find it here, how should we work? Colossians 3, 23, 24. So if you're somebody of substantial wealth, you've accrued, there is whatever you do, work heartily with these finances, with the treasures that you have, as for the Lord, not for men. That includes myself, the things that I'm generating, the finances, it says in verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. That's very important because it's indicating who is the Lord, who is the Master, He is. Luke 12, 48, but the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So consider if you are somebody that is managing a tremendous amount of wealth through the innovation that you have, through just your ability to see trends, markets, making many, whatever that skill or ability is, it's something that God has given you responsibility with and what sometimes can happen is if our identity is not formed in God identity value and worth is derived from God for us how can I say that let's consider salvation justification sanctification like two very separate things justification has us as the beneficiaries it is not anything that we could do. So what I mean by that? You and I, according to Adam's sin, sin, death is locked in us. We are born into sin. And we cannot escape eternal death. Nobody could pay the price required for God's wrath to be appeased. In this, God decides 
For God so loved the world, He sent His one and only Son to die for us. And through that process, Jesus dies for the sin of the world that all men sin, present, past, future, God's wrath is exacted fully and completely on Him so that every outstanding debt you and I might have is consumed and burnt out. And in that, the free gift for us, not for Christ, we receive. In our ability to see that He is our Lord and Savior, the Scriptures also say that you could not know who Jesus is, but that the Father opened your eyes to that reality. So the entire process of your and my salvation is hinged on the goodness of God. So we receive Christ. It is a free gift. We are positioned now because of what He has done. These gifts that He has given us it is without repentance. So whether we knew Him or didn't know Him, they work. So now when we come to salvation, there is this desire to live for God, which is called sanctification. The Edenic nature would do that in power and in much own strength. And we draw a lot of sense of self-worth from that. But now Christ comes, pays a price, and He says it doesn't matter how much money you have doesn't matter how much your skill or talent or ability is. You couldn't buy your way into heaven. There isn't a life that you could live just enough. There is nothing you could do to appease the outstanding debt. That is something that the Father had in His heart. And because of the love that the, the Son had for the Father, as it says in John, He fulfilled what was required. So... Our identity, value, and worth is derived from Him. Consider this. The value of something is in the eye of the beholder. I, some might say, lack culture. If you had to put a Picasso painting in front of me, it would go into the first dustbin. So, some of you are gasping at that. Forgive me, it's outside of my enjoyment space. But a Picasso painting, 15 million, 20 million US dollars, no problem. How is that possible? The value of it is determined by what somebody is prepared to pay for it. So it actually has nothing to do with the painting or the artist. It has to do with the one who is prepared to pay for it. So your identity, value and worth and mine, is not derived from whether I have much or have a little. It's established and firmly rooted in what God was prepared to pay for you and I. So whether I have a tremendous amount of wealth or I am barely getting by or I may die of hunger this evening, the reality is the love of God is for both of us. The death of His Son on the cross and the wrath poured out on His life was because of the great love that he has in himself, could not deny himself but to love and extended that to us. But his holiness does not come at the expense of his love. So the wrath that was required for the outstanding debt was consumed on his son, the, the, the spotless and the blameless lamb, consumed a perfect sacrifice, sweet smelling fragrance to the heavenly father. His wrath and holiness appeased in that moment, your identity, value, and worth is now secured in Him as we accept Him as our Lord and our Savior. And as we do that, we're now living, understanding that this good God that has saved us, where He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There is this revelation and realization that God's way of living is actually the best version of life possible. It is the enemy that has bewitched us to assume that we can go this way or that way. We can pursue this or that outside of God. The scriptures say to us, you who say you're going to go here for a year and trade there and buy this. Who are you? Your life is but a vapor. It's not demeaning us as people because the value of 
God's value for us was expressed in what he was prepared to pay for us. He's talking about the sense of self-importance and self-righteousness that you would feel entitled because you can, that you should. Surely you should say, the scripture says, God willing, which speaks of a recognition of who is our authority. So when you're sitting and you're listening to this and you're considering you have a tremendous amount of wealth, there is no need that you would experience any condemnation, guilt or shame for what you have been able to do. God has blessed you with a tremendous gifting and ability. The question I would ask is, who gets to direct where that finance goes? Are you perhaps saved, but these elements of ungodliness is still in your heart? Not by intent, but by design. What do I mean by this? Let's consider the wage, the minimum wage, that a country would set out for people to live. It oftentimes would imply that the person cannot do life with much dignity. It would mean that two members of the family would have to work incredibly hard, which leaves very little time for them to raise their own children. It now requires them that they have somebody else raise them. These are matters that our government has been left to decide, but the wealth and the riches and the wisdom that God has given our people of substantial wealth, it is not our responsibility to take responsibility for others. What I'm implying here is when we are making decisions in our businesses and in our companies, are we allowing the minimum wage to determine or are we trusting God and asking God what is right, what is righteous? Not so that I can save God and accrue more for me, but how does the kingdom work in this place? Because it's not about pleasing the workers. It's not about pleasing other people. It's not about being seen righteous and fair in the eyes of others. What it is speaking about is saying that we cannot have two masters. I cannot be the master of my own destiny. I cannot be the master of anything or beholden to anything, but actually to the Most High God, and He needs to direct. And that's really, really important because when the scripture talks about, let me read it to us, it is something that constantly grounds me, it puts a sense of reverence towards God in me, and it also humbles me. And I think this humbling that I'm talking about is the the flesh that would want to rise, that Paul would talk about is constantly warring against the spirit. And so I'm hoping that as I'm speaking that you would be able to interpret this in a way that the spirit of God would be incredibly faithful because my desire and hope here is not by power, not by might, neither condemnation or manipulation, but through the revelation of the Holy Spirit to understand that the gifts given to us, this world will celebrate somebody who has incredible wealth. But that end piece, to me, places an incredible responsibility on people with wealth and riches and influence. Because when it talks in verse 6, it says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. Now, we would immediately want to defend ourselves, but David, who was one of the richest men on the earth, his way of living was, you search me, O God, before you and you alone have us sinned. His highest uh, prerogative in life was... You the one that can end my life for all eternity, not the people here. You do. So it's before you I have to give an account. You search my heart. Tell me, are you happy with how I'm conducting? So the laws and the rules of this age are a guideline, but I honestly think they are incredibly below the line as far as kingdom is concerned. And so it would say a great responsibility is extended to those who much has been given. I'm referring to much has been given in this context, not only financially, but as far as wisdom, as far as knowledge, as far as insight. These gifts have been given that you would be a benefit of them, but the gifts that God has given, redeemed under Christ, is not for you and I only, but it's for the edification of the body. So it would say here in verse 6, you have condemned, murdered the righteous person. To me, 
we also have a Keith, I haven't done that, but where have we not actually inquired of God what is His will and way pertaining to something? And so to me that is more a sin of omission than a sin where we know we've transgressed, where we short paid somebody. It says here, He does not resist you. What that's talking about is it's saying, the people that work for us, the people that are poor, the people that are stuck, are powerless to do anything. Powerless because if they got into an argument with you, you could win through finance alone. They couldn't argue with us because through the evidence of what we have in the bank balance, we are silenced. The evidence of so many different things, literally just not being able to sit at the same table because we don't have the same bank balance, becomes a challenge. And these are the things that I'm saying, if we would consider the wealth that we have is His to steward and be a custodian of, we could sit at any table without any shame, guilt, because we know what has been given to us is to steward for the king. But that is something for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling is to consider that when you have so much, there's very little people that would contest you. So how would you know that the way that you live, the way that you pay, the way that you act is righteous? And so I challenge us in this regard that if the law of our country is the standard, how many laws can you think of in our cultural development, in our societal development, has been altered that's actually loyal to the enemy? I leave it at that and saying, check yourselves before God because it's before Him and Him alone that we give an account. For those of us that don't have and live in a space where we would feel... Um, I wish my boss could hear this. I wish I could, you know, I remind you again and say that you too cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. And a person that has much serving mammon is the same as somebody that has lack and is serving mammon. There is this, that if a person does not have, there is a question around obedience. Because where there is obedience, there is provision. If we to believe otherwise is to accuse God that He is not the provider. But God is not obliged to provide where there's disobedience. So whether that be in principle or in an instruction to say, leave this and go there. Either one of those is outside of God's mandate. And we will and should, as God's children, expect Him to discipline us or hinder us because He he does that to those that He loves. He chastises those that He loves because it's not about this world, it's about Him. And when God is glorified, we are edified. So there is no picking on any particular person. And I'm not going to elaborate too much on this component, but to say to those of us that are working in environments where it might be of an oppressive nature, to remind you, as Colossians 3, 23, 24, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord. You are not serving your master. There are many testimonies, if I had the time, I could share with you, where the redeemed of Christ are working in oppressive environments and the light that is in them has shone in the darkness and they've turned those things around. But if you are looking to others for the transformative power that should be in you to flow out, we will not see the kingdom come. That is all the time I have for today. I trust that the Spirit of God would be with you to work these things out. The Bible says to us to work out our faith with fear and trembling. These things are worth searching out, but I know that our God is faithful and true, and He will give us what we need to fulfill that which He has called us to do. God bless, and have a great day. Jesus, you're our only hope. 
Jesus, you're our light. All things in this world are held together by you, our Lord of all. Jesus, you're our perfect peace. Jesus, you're our strength. Christ in us, the hope of glory all to you, our Lord of all. All through you, all things were made in the heavens and the earth. You uphold the world by the power of your word, majesty on high, majesty. Jesus, you're our only hope. Jesus, you're our light. All things in this world are held together by you, our Lord of all. Jesus, you're our perfect peace. Jesus, you're our strength. In us the hope of glory unto you, our Lord of all. All through you, all things are made in the heavens and the earth. You uphold the world by the power of your word, majesty on. Just me on For through you all things were made In the heavens and the earth You uphold the world by the power of your word Majesty on higher Majesty You're our only 
Yeah. 